Um, today we're going to be using it as an opportunity to remind ourselves of the connection that we have with Kettle Marine through the high school of 27 congregations that support and are benefited from Kettle Marine through high school down in Jackson. And so today, um, one of their instructors, Pastor Randy Hughes, is going to be here. He'll, he'll be preaching a sermon, um, very apt sermon on the fact that uh, that as we are connected to Christ, we remain in Christ. There's there's an encouragement, there's a warning there, as you'll see in the sermon there. But uh, we'll begin with a special service with the first hymn, Blessed Be the Tide That Binds. <laughs>
concerns, asks, thankfulness, and praises. Draw us as Christians together under the banner of your holy truths that are only found in Holy Scripture. Allow us to experience your free and full forgiveness and the nourishment that supports our spiritual lives of faithfulness to you. Make us bold and courageous to preach and teach your holy word with our lives, words, and actions. Amen. Dear friends, let us approach God with a true heart and confess our sins, asking Him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to forgive us. Lord of life, I confess that I am by nature dead in sin. For every case of swearing and selfish pride, for sins of act and sins of choice, for the evil I have done and the good I have failed to do, you should cast me away from your presence forever. O Lord, I am sorry for my sins. Forgive me for Jesus' sake. Christ has died. Christ is risen, Christ will come again. In His great mercy, God made us alive in Christ even when we were dead in our sins. Hear the word of Christ through His call servant. I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you. 
morning we worship in the name of him who established our roots in the fertile soil of his holy word, and to him who fertilizes the root system to produce fruits of faith to God's glory. Our reading for our sermon text was our gospel reading, a rather familiar section to Christians, section on, I am the vine and you are the branches. And based off of that reading today, I open with really one rather simple question for you. The question is, did you plant a garden this past year? And if the answer is yes, the question probably is, how well did that garden do? I planted mine and it pretty much turned out to be an epic failure. My Roma tomatoes looked about the size of cherry tomatoes, planted three hills of cucumbers from which I had one usable piece of fruit, planted green beans which did pretty well except for the ones that the deer sheared off. However, the bright side of that garden was that my cherry tomatoes, even though looking like my Roma tomatoes, did quite well. And my zucchinis did great. When I look back and ask myself why did my garden do so poorly this past year, I knew that the finger pointed back at me. Didn't take time at the beginning because of some building projects to fertilize the soil very well. Planted and just thought maybe there'll be some residual carryover. Then we got to that really dry spell in June and for about two weeks just kind of forgot to water most of those plants and consequently I know I did damage to the root system and even when we got a little later in the season kind of ignored the spices and the herbs and they kind of turned brown and I, I blame myself because I think I should know better in my early years I was raised on a farm so I should know something about planting and harvesting after we left the farm, we took over an orchard, and then for probably all of my high school career, plus about three years of college, I worked at a seed corp company. I should know something about farming, planting, and harvesting. So why do I ask that question this morning? Because God asked that same question of all of us. And the question is, is how well are you doing? Spiritually, are you growing? When we take a look at this very first section of Scripture, Jesus certainly uses a picture that all of his disciples could understand. It was the grape arbor. It was the vines that they would plant, hoping, of course, to produce grapes that in turn could be used for eating, but most likely most of them were turned into their wine. And the wine for them was an important product because, to be honest, the water in that area isn't always very good. So as much as they didn't always drink the wine straight up, quite often they would mix it in with their water, give the water a little better flavor at their meals. And so there it was. I am the vine and you are the branches. <laughs> What Jesus was telling them, it was very well known to all of them, that anyone that plants a vineyard is going to go out to find the very best parent plant, the root system from which everything else would grow so that when it came to harvest, they would have the very best product. Anyone that still grows Grape arbors for wine in all these different areas is always looking for the very best parent plant. Why? Because the connection of all those vines back to the root from which it gathers all of its nutrients is important. It's like a little tiny fetus connected by an umbilical cord to its mother. All of those initial nutrients that that child receives in its early infant years as it's growing from the mother. Perhaps the reason why mothers are given 
some rather specific directions on diets, what to eat, what not to eat, what to drink, what not to drink, because all of it filters back down to that little fetus. God says he is our parent plant. And as our parent plant, he is going to give strength and rigor to all of the vines that come off of the parent plant. As we look at God's <clears throat> as we look at God's connection with us today, we have to go all the way back to one of the very first trees. All the way back to the Garden of Eden. And there it was. The explanation <clears throat> as to why humankind has rejected God and walked away from Him. Because our, our parents, Adam and Eve, from way back, were the first ones to create that disconnect between God and man. And unfortunately for all of us, once that disconnect took place, we each got to inherit that from our parents. So much so that we have what we call original sin that separates us from the parent plant. And perhaps the question then always is, how do you get that connection back? For Jesus, the day that he most likely spoke these words would have been Monday, Thursday. Either the night in the upper room, or maybe earlier in the day. But he shared that section on, I am the vine and you are the branches with his disciples. He did it for two reasons. He did it to give them both warning and encouragement. You can imagine that at least 11 of those disciples on that particular day needed to hear it more so for encouragement. Because Jesus already knew what was going to happen to him as he was taken into captivity by the Jewish people. He knew that at that moment there were going to be 11 disciples who would disperse in fear and hide behind closed doors. So they needed to hear this as encouragement, which was saying to them, you need to stay connected. I have a bigger vision for you, which is going to be sharing God's word with the entire Mediterranean area. For one person by the name of Judas, he especially needed to hear it as a warning. A warning that Jesus was saying to Judas, stay connected. But Jesus already knew what was in Judas's heart. And he knew that Judas had already become disconnected from his Lord. And that's why he turned his Savior over for silver. What God is saying to us is that, much like his disciples on that night, we need to hear this also as both encouragement and as warning. An encouragement that says as long as you are connected to Jesus Christ, he will continue to grow you with spiritual rigor so that you can stand up against all of the bullies of this world that stand against God. We need to hear it as a warning that when our faith becomes weak, when we face challenges and troubles and trials, God says, just like to Judas, stay connected and don't become separated. Now the words that God speaks this morning are rather convincingly haunting nearly 2,000 years later. Because those same actions of the disciples, those that dispersed out of fear, Judas who betrayed for money, stands for each and every one of us. How many times have we walked away from our Savior? How many times have we created a disconnect between us and the parent plant? How many times have we denied our Savior like Peter? And over and over again, God says, hear these words to stay connected. As we work to stay connected, even though those words are convincingly haunting, we also have two things that God tells us. The law is that hangman's noose that hangs over each and every one of our heads. 
reminding us that we should suffer eternal damnation. And many times during our life, it stands as a shadow against our wall of life that we can see swinging back and forth, reminding us of the potential condemnation. But at the same time, Christ enters the picture and says, stay connected to me, and you never have to worry about the detriments of eternal damnation. Stay connected to me, and I will give you the strength to stay close to your Lord God. And so Jesus goes from that tree in the Garden of Eden all the way to the tree of the cross. And he gives up everything. He gives up his life. He even gives up his relationship with God the Father. That for a moment in time, he was separated from God himself and suffered the pains of eternal damnation, all in behalf of sinful human beings. You know, the gardener, as much as he harvests good fruit, he has to spend a lot of work before getting that fruit, cultivation of the soil, making sure that as he walks through his garden, that there isn't a whole lot of dead wood sucking up all the nutrients and producing absolutely nothing. And so the section here portrays God the Father walking through that garden and trimming off all of the dead wood. The dead wood that produces absolutely nothing and is detrimental to the actual parent plant, the root system. And so as he trims all of that dead wood off, he tosses it over on a pile to be burned which is symbolic of unbelievers going to their eternal damnation. And every time I read this section of scripture, <coughs> it is very picturesque for me. Because as I stated earlier, I spent quite a bit of time growing up on an orchard. And so my Dad would usually say pretty late into the fall after all of the apples had been harvested. He would turn to my oldest brother and me and he would say, okay boys, we need to start trimming the trees. My heart just sank. Because as a kid, I knew that my dad wasn't talking about an afternoon project. He was talking about weeks of work. Weeks of work because we see we had 500 apple trees and none of them were dwarfs. And every year that we went out with him and he was trimming and we would be picking up and stacking and piling all the dead wood, in my brain I kept asking the question, how can there be so much dead wood? We just cut it all off last year. But every year, new dead wood. And then one bright spot of the entire fall happened on a specific day when my dad carried out a five-gallon can of kerosene, poured it on top of the dead wood, and handed to each, both me and my brother, one match. And we got to light all that dead wood up in a tremendous, glorious bonfire we just sat and watched all of that burn. <laughs> you know, God the Father cuts off the dead wood, but he finds absolutely no joy in lighting up the dead wood of unbelief, destroying individuals in eternal damnation. Finds absolutely no joy because Jesus says, I would have all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. That is God's desire for all of us, as well as the unbelieving world. But unfortunately, there will be those, just like Judas, who will reject the vine, who will disconnect and sever that relationship, and then God the Father has only one choice left. It's to prune the dead wood. Each and every day I have this 
wonderful opportunity to walk through the doors to a high school called Kettle Marine Lutheran High School. High school that I barely even knew existed, to be honest, till my sophomore year of college when one of my close friends said, do you want to go and head back to where I live and see my high school? Small little high school. When I entered the doors years later, through a call, 235 students. And now today, about 30 years later, 550. God has certainly blessed both the efforts and the opportunities to teach teenagers about the message of staying connected to Christ. And as you would imagine, quite often when I walk through those doors, I have the garden variety Christians, the ones that are coming from churches like this, from our Christian grade schools, 27 of them, 27 churches, 13 grade schools. And they've already had the seed planted. Most of them, if not all of them, are already have a connection with their parent via Jesus Christ. So we get to help them grow in knowledge and in strength of faith during their four years. But I also get a, a really special group of students. A special group of students, some of them coming from overseas, some of them coming from close local areas in our community. And as they walk through the doors, quite often what their parents are looking for is a school with a safe environment. They're looking for quality education. They're looking for a place where their son or daughter is not going to be bullied. They are looking for academic performance that will lead them on towards their dreams of college and beyond. They are not necessarily walking through that door saying, I am looking to study and learn more about Jesus Christ, my Savior. As a matter of fact, I get to teach that class, which is divided into two, a lower level and an upper level, and it's called Intro to Christianity. This year I have 18 students in Intro to Christianity, and on the first day I asked them a very simple question. How many of you know that Jesus Christ is your Savior? And from the 18, three hands were raised. And then as you begin to talk to them more about who God is, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and direct them towards Jesus, the miracle of faith begins. And the Holy Spirit starts to work. No credit to me, I just get to be a mouthpiece for the Spirit. And so then, right before semester exams of Christmas, I put the very last question on their semester exam, and it says, counts absolutely zero points, no credit given. But the question says, how many of you believe that you have grown to know that Jesus is your Savior? And then I get to read the responses. And the 15 who at one point said, I don't know anything really about Jesus or God, now said, I understand now who God is. I understand what God expects of me. By going through the articles, I understand something more that there is a Father, a Son, and a Holy Spirit. Two students said, how do I get confirmed? One student said, I think I believe, but I think my faith is small, and I hope that it continues to grow. Every year I have the opportunity to see new, budding, and flourishing teenagers who are connected for the first time, maybe, to their Savior, Jesus Christ. God tells us this morning in our text definitely to stay connected. Not only because he wants all men to be saved, but even for us as Christians, he says, if you remain in me and I in you, 
you will bear much fruit. The expectation of God is all of the good that is going to come through our knowledge that Jesus has already done it all for us. The result is that we, the group of Christians, grow together through the strength of God's holy word and his sacraments. So, God speaks to us this morning and says, keep growing, Christians, and then go out and make disciples of all nations. Amen. We continue with our statement of faith, which actually is found in song, We All Believe in One True God. Yes, us. And lead us not into temptation, but to 
In stanza of 566, verse 2, we are all one English. this year, but I always appreciate having that because as you go from a pastor in a parish to a pastor in a school, you don't preach nearly as often um, as a parish pastor, so we'd like to keep some of those skills brushed up on. Um, I'm not Deadwood, but I am Oldwood. Uh, when I arrived at Kettle Moraine Lutheran High School, I was the youngest um, teacher at that stage. And now I think um, there's only two who are older than me um, that have been teaching. And so as I, I see all of these young called workers coming in, to me it's just been amazing what a wonderful job they do as they come in and fill positions. Um, nearly over the last five years, 60% of our current staff is all brand new, which is a huge changeover in a company, a business, a school. Um, but part of that comes from people who have retired, took calls. Uh, the other part comes from a growing student population. When I arrived uh, in 1994, uh, we were 235 students strong, and now we're over 550. So I've seen growth that way. If I live just long enough, or I'm able to serve just a little bit longer, I think I will be experiencing my fifth addition to Kettle Moraine Lutheran High School, and that's over 30 years. Five additions in 30 years almost seems crazy to me uh, when I think about it, but yet the Lord keeps blessing us, and some schools that have been around much longer than us, because uh, we're going to be coming up next year on 50 years. Um, that means that this school wasn't even built until I was 10 years old. Uh, we're not a very old school, so consequently we keep adding on for the growth factor. <clears throat> Other schools that are much older, like Owisco, 
You know, they don't have to build very much or very often because they've been large for a long time. And so consequently, they're able to pour a lot more of their resources into other things um, at their high school than building block and mortar. Um, but that's still a blessing for us as we continue to grow. I still can't believe when I walk uh, some kids through who were my first four-year students. They graduated in 1997, and a couple of them came back again this year, and they're like, Pastor Hughes, can you show us around our high school? And they walk in, they are totally lost. They have no idea where they are in the high school. They have no idea where their locker used to be. You know, it, it just is so new that it's like, here, let me walk through. I'll show you where the old walls were. I'll show you where it used to be. And, and so we definitely have changed over the years. So um, during your Bible study today, I'm going to share a little bit more, um, not just about building blocks, but really uh, how Kettle has grown with all of the people, but even in administration. Um, growing really to be a strong leader of area Lutheran high schools, and that's your high school. So I also want to thank you for all the support that many of you have given over the years. Some might be more new to it. Um, I also thank you for lending us your pastor, because uh, Pastor Bodie came, I believe, after Pastor Strong, and I've been here long enough to know Pastor Strong as well. Uh, he has dedicated quite a few years to being on our board and being a part of the growth factor and trying to share, you know, where is the, the leadership going? Where is this high school going? So uh, I think you retired from that position maybe about two years ago, uh, but dedicated a lot of years. And so we, we borrowed uh, him from you uh, to give us some of that as well. Outside of that, I'm going to wish you a very um, blessed week ahead, and maybe I will see you in the Bible study.